Good day, Nick. How you doing, mate? Yeah, good to see you, Woody. Every Friday. Every Friday. I thought I'd just jump in. First things first, though, quick update. Last week, uh, there was a bank was being demolished right outside your window. How's that going? Yeah, right now, it sort of looks like somebody uh, successfully robbed the bank. Um, there's a big hole in the in the wall, uh, and, and the windows are sort of, they've, they haven't been blown Take out. Take your chance. It looks like yeah, they look like, well, you know, maybe this is more lucrative than um, than being a newsletter writer, just robbing banks that you live next door to, because right now, you know, it's a good opportunity. Well, I mean, we're a company of fat tail ideas. That's pretty fat tail, <laughs> I guess. Uh, probably not recommended, though. Um, definitely, you'd have to check with our compliance manager before you even go anywhere near that one. Um, but today, Nick, you're talking about big tech and AI and energy and the impact on the broader energy market. Uh, you, you, you mentioned that big tech companies are ado adopting small modular reactors, SMRs, for their energy needs, particularly for AI data centers. Um, how do you think this trend might impact the energy market more broadly and potentially government policies on renewable energy? I've never had such high hopes of going viral because I'm, I'm hitting all the nails, right? I've got the, the big tech, nuclear... <laughs> AI, it's, it's all the big themes, all, all in one video it's combined. It's a thumbnail already. Yeah. So um, the, the idea is that this sudden surge of news from big tech companies developing their AI, AI data centers, they're using small modular reactors to do so. Uh, and oh, just overnight, actually, since I wrote my, my article, there's been news from, I think, Amazon, um, announcing that they're interested in charging their delivery vehicles, which are going to be battery electric cars, vans, uh, and also their data centers with small, small modular reactors. So actually the recommendations that I've made on the back of these small modular, modular reactor um, announcements and trends is, is up 220 something percent over the last few months. So things are going really well there. Um, and this, this flood, uh, it's turned into a flood of nuclear and small modular reactor news is, is just absolutely out overwhelming, you know, the small little companies that were not so long ago, just um, speculative, you know, revenue-less companies that had, um, you know, high hopes, but nuclear is always supposed to be the next big thing, right? Suddenly it's all happening. Uh, and my question in the article today is, what does this mean for the energy system as a whole? Because it, it poses a really, really awkward question for the rest of us. Why are these big tech companies relying on their own sources of power, private sources of power that they them themselves control and, and secure and pay for? Why are they not relying on the same electricity grid that you and I use? What do they know about the electricity grid that you and I use that tells them it's not going to be able to deliver the type of electricity that they need? Um, because, you know, doing all this SMR stuff, it's very expensive and complex and unproven. Um, you know, nobody's rolled these out commercially. So, there must be something seriously wrong with our electricity grid for these companies to decide to go their own way, to decide to do a DIY approach for securing their own electricity. And I think it should be a, uh, you know, it's a, a klaxon or a warning bell or a canary dropping dead for the rest of us, because you know we need electricity just like AI data, data centers and, and um, you know, all these other companies that are using SMRs too. Um, Dow Chemical, I think, is, is thinking about developing what is it about the their existing electricity grid that they don't trust? Uh, and why aren't the rest of us aware of the same thing? Yeah, yeah. Well, that was going to be my next uh, question, Nick, since you do suggest that, you know, the companies that are investing in their own power sources implies a lack of faith in f future reliability of the public grid. But what what specific concerns then do you think are driving driving that shift towards energy independence from specific companies would you i would never suggest i would never suggest that our electricity grid is unreliable or going to face blackouts in the future that would be highly irresponsible um so obviously what's going on here is that the ai data centers need a huge amount more power i think they've increased the or expected to increase power demands on the us grid by 20 to 25 percent i can't remember the time frame off the top of my head now um but the point is that this has rewritten the power demand projections and therefore, renewable energy just isn't going to cut it. And the energy transition, as we currently know it, mm. which already required a hell of a lot of cutting of demand, isn't going to cut it anymore. Um, these companies that are developing these AI data centers say they want safe, reliable, clean fuel. 
Now, that's very interesting because governments have committed to providing clean, say, power by 2030. You know, so some, something's out here. Something's not going to succeed. Either our electricity is not going to be safe, reliable, or clean because otherwise these data centers wouldn't need to build their own SMRs. Um, and so I think this is a, a, an indirect admission um, that we're not going to have the power system that we need. And the AI companies are saying, well, we're not going to rely on the grid as it stands because that's not going to work. We're going to seek our own sources of power. Now, think about what that means for politicians right now because, you know, there's nothing like seeing an AI data center running with the lights on while you're in a blackout, you know, because the wind's not shining or the, the, um, the wind's not blowing or the sun's not shining or there's not enough power storage or one of the interconnected cables hasn't been built yet or whatever it might be. In the um, Strategic Intelligence Australia, We've been writing about some of these issues that are you know, vulnerabilities in the electricity grid and how they might be solved. But the point is, you know, for the course of human existence, we've always demanded more and more and more and more energy. And there's a new book about that. It's called More and More and More Something uh, by a French energy historian. And his point is that the energy demand is constantly growing and the demand for all of these energy sources that we supposedly transition out of actually grows. Um, so, for example, when we transition from wood to coal, it actually increased the demand for wood because of all these new things that had to get built, new houses, you know, railway sleepers, all these sorts of new uses for wood developed. So we didn't transition from wood to coal. We just increased the demand for everything as a result of you know, human flourishing. Um, so did that taper off, though, when eventually coal and oil took over? Well, think about how much biomass Europe's using right now. <laughs> but anyway, so no, because, you know, the economies grew so much. Economies grew so much. The population grew so much. Everything grew, grew so much that the demand's gone nuts. So we're using record amounts of coal, So, for example. You know, we didn't use less iron ore yeah. Yeah. as a result of not shoeing horses anymore, right? So it, it, you know, instead of blacksmiths, we've got these huge steel industries. So every, every, the idea is that growth outweighs, wow, well, does all other considerations. So it's not an energy transition, historically speaking. Yep. What governments are trying to engineer now is it's an energy transition. more of an energy evolution, isn't it? Yeah. And, and well, it's not just evolution because it's the growth factor. So there's so much more demand for everything that that outweighs the, you know, the phase out of anything. Um, so we're at the, uh, the, for the first time ever, we've got governments trying to impose an actual transition away from things like coal and gas and so on and so forth. Uh, and that would be very much against what's been happening throughout all of human history. So I guess what the AI data center and SMI revolution is doing is saying gov what governments are trying to do doesn't work. And the big energy demand boom that's happening right now because of technology, which is always the case, so, you know, with coal and steam engines and oil and, and in combustion engines, th that, that transition is happening again. We've got this new technological phase, which is, as always, incredibly in energy intensive, and therefore the growth in overall energy demand is going to dominate everything. That's also been what's happening just generally with things like coal um, and oil, where the growth in places like China and so on and so forth uh, is so large that it outdoes by orders of magnitude any changes that are happening in places like Australia and Europe, um, where they are killing off coal, obviously, um, but total coal demand is soaring. So, we're not actually getting anywhere on the, on the emission. All, you know, all these charts of emissions that show China's emissions have grown far more than anything we could possibly hope to offset in Europe and, the, uh, and, and Australia uh, make the same point in, in you know, the, the opposite way, um, that emissions are growing so much because overall demand and growth is growing so much. So the tech companies have realized this and they're not waiting for governments and politicians to say, well, actually, we need to build huge amounts of nuclear power reactors because we need to grow electricity supply enormously. They're saying governments have stuffed this up so badly, we need to find our own solution. And we're going to end up with these AI data centers with the lights on while the homes around them may not, um, which is uh, an interesting political um, situation, right? Mm. So the way I've, I've put this, or I've claimed this in the article is to say that there's some sort of inadvertent war that's been declared by big tech on renewables. So if, if renewable energy is, you know, too intermittent uh, and won't provide enough energy to feed our demand in the future, and this has been pointed out and admitted by big tech, that's the same as saying this whole energy transition revolution stuff is a waste of time. We need to go all out for nuclear. Um, and perhaps this is the catalyst that changes things. 
Um, it's the admission by governments saying, we thought we could transition from our current energy system to greens, uh, green energy, um, which implies using less energy, but that's okay, to, to we need so much more energy, we need, you know, renewables not going to cut it. Uh, and this could basically torpedo the whole green energy um, sector, but also the, you know, the, the build out of these huge infrastructure projects, um, all these subsea power cables and high voltage direct current power cables, that, that whole world, um, if it can't provide the energy demands that we need in the future, it's not worth doing. Um, j just on the point that where, where you said the AI's energy demands are reshaping the power industry and the structure of it, how, how do you think this might, and I, I know the political side of it currently, but how might that affect future energy planning and infrastructure development in Australia that is currently lacking nuclear power at the moment? Yeah, well, you've, you've, you've answered this question there. It basically just means we need to go to nuclear power. So there's a, an environmentalist group. It's one of the most iconic, historic environmentalist groups called the Sierra Club in the US, and they've recently swapped from being anti to pro-nuclear because of this, this issue of there's just too much demand. Um, and it's sort of obvious, like if you're going to electrify everything, then the amount of demand you're going to need is massive. And you can either build this complicated network of energy infrastructure, energy storage and renewables, or just put in nuclear power. Um, so the way I start the article off this week is by saying that it's only a matter of time before Anthony Albanese's legacy becomes that he stood in the, in the way of you know, the only source of electricity that is clean, reliable and provides enough power. Um, for, for, for all of our needs. So he must be panicking because, you know, for the rest of his life, he's going to be known as the person who prevented Australia from being part of the energy revolution that's now happening all around the world. Everyone's going to nuclear, every government, every country, they're all changing. Um, and in the places that they're not, the election's going to change that soon. So, you know, the nuclear revolution is happening without Australia so far. I, I don't think that can last much longer. Um, how, that, how that changes Australia will be interesting. Um, but, you know, we need a lot of nuclear, a lot, uh, to keep up with this energy demand and the electrification of everything. Um, and, you know, compared to how much infrastructure and renewables we need, um, you know, it's, it's not that much. So it is obviously the better option. Uh, just finally, uh, just uh, to bring it back to like an investment implication, um, it might not be, it might be happening all around the world and, and not here just yet, but for investors, that's actually, surely that gives people understand this an advantage right because it means um, there's still time to, to to move in and get a little slice and I know with your strategic intelligence uh, your, you, it was just this morning you sent the nuclear and uranium related plays in the portfolio the model portfolio that I think you recommended back in 2022 so you're well ahead of the story they're showing quite significant uh, portfolio growth right yeah, the uranium part's not doing as well as the others. I think it's only just recovered to be up about 20 or 30%. Um, this morning, it's traded up massively. Mm. Um, the ones, the parts that are booming are the small modular reactor companies, basically because they're extremely speculative yeah. and we just caught, caught this trend perfectly from the beginning of this year, just when the whole SMR story and the connection yeah. to AI yeah. really boomed. Um, and the company in uh, the UK that was recommended back in 2022 has boomed for a long list of reasons um, only one of which is a small modular reactor story, a small part of their business. Um, but the, it seems like this nuclear story is so big you can invest in just about any part of it. Um, and there's many different angles uh, of the nuclear industry to invest in. The uranium part is the part that is listed on the ASX. Um, I'm not convinced that that's the best way though because uranium supply can rise very quickly as well as demand. Um, I'm actually very shocked at how fast the uranium, sorry, the nuclear power restarts have been happening over the last few weeks which means a big demand shock to uranium in the short run, but supply can adjust there. I think the better opportunities are in the SMR sector, um, especially if you think governments are gonna hold on to this green dream delusion for a bit longer, forcing the rest of us um, to invest in, in SMRs if we want reliable, safe, um, clean power, or to go with things like nuclear waste, um, the companies that build the big nuclear power plants, they're listed in France and Korea and places like that, um, yeah, so you have to be an international investor to some extent in order to, to benefit from this, um, which brings in a whole host of other new risks and, and costs that you know we probably should should talk about sometime. Mm. Fascinating. We'll definitely do that. Uh, guys, if you're watching, let me know what you think. Um, and if you'd like to us to, to, to talk more about the kinds of opportunities and how you could...
played this sort of big thematic story. Nick, thanks so much for your time. If you would like to read Nick's original piece, obviously the link's below in the description and sign up to Fat Tell Daily. You get insights like this on a daily basis for free. Can't think of anything better. Cheers, Nick. Take care, mate, and I'll see you next week.